ladies and gentlemen. Greetings and welcome to the public seminar on Digital Trust, a vital impetus to growth, organized by the Center for Banking Studies, the training arm of the Central Bank of Sri Lanka. I hope you all are ready to engage in a meaningful and insightful discussion. Talking about the aim of today's seminar, this seminar is to highlight the essential role that digital trust can play in driving economic growth in Sri Lankan context. As we all know, in today's business landscape, it is important to establish and maintain digital trust between businesses, consumers, and government authorities. Essentially, trust in digital systems nurtures a fa favorable environment for innovation, investments, and seamless digital interactions to boost the competitiveness and the economic growth. In this significant moment, Center for Banking Studies deeply appreciate ISACA, Information Systems Audit and Control Association, Sri Lanka chapter, for their steadfast support in igniting our enthusiasm for this topic and also connecting us with the right people and the right resources for the event. Thank you, Isaka Sri Lanka chapter for this strength. Now, it's time that we recognize the dignitaries of the head table. We have here Mrs. K. M. A. N. Daulagala, the Deputy Governor of the Central Bank of Sri Lanka. Our speakers today, Mr. Indikadu Soisa, the Chairman of the Federation of Information Technology Industry, Sri Lanka, and Mr. Mohan Chaturanga, a cybersecurity professional and a consultant, and is the former Deputy General Manager, IT Governance at the Mass Holdings, and also member ISACA Sri Lanka. We have a very interesting lineup for today's seminar. We'll start, the opening, uh, we'll start with the opening remarks from Mrs. Daulagala, the Deputy Governor of the Central Bank of Sri Lanka. Following the opening remarks, Mr. Indikada Soisa will deliver the keynote address. And then Mr. Mohan Chaturanga will continue the discourse with a specific emphasis on the cybersecurity. Finally, our audience will have the opportunity to bring up any questions during the Q&A session. Well, having discussed the lineup of the event, let us now proceed to the seminar. To begin with, I would like to cordially invite Mrs. Daulagala, the Deputy Governor of the Central Bank of Sri Lanka, to grace the event with opening remarks. So a warm welcome to everyone. Since the world becomes increasingly digital and firms with tra firms transformation to stay ahead, there is greater need than ever to protect information and processes. Evolving regulatory landscapes are also making it necessary for entities to reorient their strategies as well as responses. Accordingly, gaining consumer trust and confidence in one's products and services, digital systems and processes, what is known as digital trust, has become vital for creating a secure digital world and to provide impetus to economic growth. The objective of digital trust is not limited to minimizing risks. It can also unleash potential of promising technologies such as artificial intelligence, blockchain networks, internet of things, and machine learning, enabling their use with increased confidence. Thus, digital trust will continue to drive innovation, automation, and connectivity transforming traditional industries and enhancing customer experience and satisfaction. Digital trust is a key foundation for economic growth, shaping consumer behaviors, business transactions in a digital age, while building confidence among consumers, encouraging increased online transactions and driving e-commerce expansion. The digital economy is expected to experience significant growth and transformation globally due to technological advancements, increased connectivity and adoption of 
emerging technologies. The expansion of e-commerce and digital platforms create new business opportunities and reshapes traditional industries leading to entrepreneurship, job creation and economic growth. Bridging the digital divide and ensuring equitable access to technology and digital skills is critical for economic empowerment and social development on a global scale. Governments, businesses and international organizations must collaborate to establish policy frameworks, foster innovative ecosystems and address global challenges such as digital taxation, cross-border data flows to better facilitate economic activities. Collaboration between government and stakeholders will be vital to address challenges and seize opportunities in digital economy, promoting sustainable growth. Investing in people is essential to develop a digital economy and digitally proficient workforce while steering innovation and efficiency gains economy-wide. Digital economy is transforming various sectors of Sri Lanka's economy as well. Efforts to improve digital infrastructure and connectivity, expand e-commerce and promote digital financial services have driven growth and market access. Similar to other developing countries, Sri Lanka is also faced with regulatory challenges in fully harnessing the potential of digital economy including regulatory frameworks, data privacy and cyber security issues, particularly in the rural areas. Meanwhile, Sri Lanka aims to boost its digital economy to US dollars 15 billion by 2030 from about 4 billion now. Aligning the chapters of Federation of Information Technology in Industry Sri Lanka, which is the apex body of ICT industry, to drive the digital economy agenda is crucial to achieving this vision. Ultimately, this initiative will benefit the entire economy with enhanced digital trust. We have the chairman of the federation here with us, Mr. Disoisa. The world-class digital economy will help Sri Lankan entities to connect the global value chains and production networks and gain enhanced benefits. Further, digital technology will naturally act to catalyze the development and growth of all other strategic sectors, including tourism, banking and finance, manufacturing and health. In addition, with digital economic initiatives, delivery of government services could also be strengthened by way of increased connectivity, seamless delivery across wide range of service providers, modes, and accessible to all con conveniently. State officials need to be educated and empowered to make use of digital tools to serve citizens efficiently and effectively. As the digital economy expands, cybersecurity also becomes crucial for protecting sensitive data, securing digital infrastructure, and building trust in digital systems. In order to build trust in digital systems, online security and data protection will be important. Important considerations for any digital solution adopted by stakeholders of the economy. Data security and the treatment of personal and sensitive data are crucial. Since technology connect everything and everyone instantaneously. Data security is essential in ensuring national security and sovereignty too. While resolving these concerns transparently, it is also important to provide some degree of freedom to enable the use of data for secondary purposes to facilitate innovation. Accordingly, enacting necessary laws, for instance, the proposed Data Protection Act and the Cyber Security Act, and also policies, standards, norms to establish a regulatory environment to protect stakeholders and accommodating necessary amendments when necessary would also be important. So CBS has today organized this uh, public seminar which is very timely and apt uh, on the subject of digital trust as a vital impetus to growth 
and I thank CBS for that. And I also thank the panelists who have joined us today, Mr. Indaka Disoisa and Mr. Mohan Chaduranga. Thank you very much for joining us. And we look forward to a very interesting and insightful discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Madam. Then we will return towards the keynote address of today's seminar, uh, which will be delivered by Mr. Indika Desoisa. Allow me to provide you with a brief introduction to Mr. Indika Desoisa. Mr. Indika Desoisa is a global business leader with expertise in many areas. These areas include strategic planning, business development and transformations, corporate social responsibility, innovation and technology transformation. Currently, he holds the position of strategic advisor and vice presidency at Huawei Technologies Lanka Private Limited. And he holds the office of vice chairman of the ICT Skills Council of Sri Lanka. He is a council member of the Computer Society of Sri Lanka as well. Over to you, sir. OK. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for that uh, introduction. Uh, it's a bit of a tough time to deliver a, a keynote uh, just after lunch. Uh, so I'll try my best to keep you all entertained and awake uh, for the next half an hour or so. Uh, topic of what I'm going to talk about is the uh, digital economy. As the uh, governor was talking, the deputy governor was talking about importance of the digital economy uh, for a nation. Uh, and for organizations and even for as individuals or citizens for us. But what makes this uh, important for us and what's the difference it will bring into the equation. Uh, so uh, I've been, as introduced, I've been in uh, the industry for close to about 30 years, uh, being doing uh, different jobs. Primarily, I've been coming from more of a sales background. Uh, so I worked for a US company. Uh, for about 15 years, uh, that's Intel. Uh, then I was in the government for about two years, uh, which is really didn't blend with my thinking, probably had to go out from that <laughs> quicker. Uh, then now I'm working for Huawei, that's a Chinese company. So I have seen uh, what you call this uh, geopolitics, how the US company to how it's shifting uh, towards the uh, other parts of the world as well. So that's that's possibly the experience I bring in it. I blend with what I've learned uh, and what is there and what as an industry association what we are doing and what the benefit which is as a nation we can harvest out of it and how we can take forward. Uh, so with that the topic I will talk about as I said the fuel in the digital economy from a federation point of view which is as the apex body. Uh, so looking at the statement uh, I think Deputy Governor very well explained this as well like you know digital economy is becoming a key uh, indicator for any, any economy in the world. Uh, whereas uh, digital uh, is getting blended to day in and day out, every profession we do. Um, so during COVID, I think this got really fast tracked. Uh, all of us work from home. Uh, all our children studied from home. Uh, we ordered our food, uh, like, you know, vegetables to meet to everything uh, online. We basically, uh, like, you know, what would have been happened 10 years or 15 years got really squeezed into uh, two to three years due to the COVID situation since we were uh, more of on isolation and working out of home, right? Uh, so just imagine uh, like uh, if we didn't had the two years uh, uh, student would have lost or three years, two and a half years student would have lost from education or university level. That's like half of the degree time or work we have done lost with, without the connectivity and the, the tools what we use during this time. So with that, the digital economy topic became a much more hotter topic because people never went back uh, to some of the uh, regular work. They continue to do that because they found the productivity, cost reduction, etc. Uh, using the same uh, digital tools and they continue to do that. Uh, some offices like, you know, large corporates actually like more or less gave away like, you know, compared to maybe 30 to 40 percent or some have 50 percent of their workspace. Uh, because people are moved really back uh, to the uh, work from home environment. So, I mean, giving a background that's really fast track the digital economy and that became last couple of years as a key focus. So now, 
Uh, when you're looking at this, right, like, you know, we are just recovering from a, uh, the, like a close down or a COVID situation. Uh, world is actually looking down the barrel, which is for an uh, economic downturn, uh, which is we are already facing uh, due to the challenges what we had. So, on a principally, there are two things, right, like, you know, when you do the recovery, uh, you will end up in a high, you will recover or you will end up in a low. So this decision has to be made where to take the right decisions, which is, I mean, I mean, definitely the National Bank is one of the key pillars of that on uh, taking the decision making on the right path on an economic point of view together with the finance ministry, etc. Uh, so how do you make sure as a nation we get the curve up uh, to a new high? So this is, this is the key. Uh, so which is, I will talk about what is the role of digital. Uh, place here. It's it's not about IT, like you know, a lot of people think like you know, when you say digital economy, it's not about like you know getting techno IT into the system. It's much more than that. It's much more than that. And the contribution and the transformation, what you do, and what is the contribution it can do to the GDP. Now, to get like you know think like you know get in you know, a fresh mind, uh, look at these brands like you know Yahoo, BlackBerry, uh, or Walkman, Nokia, Kodak. Uh, these brands. Uh, so possibly generation mine uh, when we did our masters etc like you know these are the brands we took as examples. Uh, case studies we use of these brands uh, and uh, how strong these brands are and we'll learn about it. Now can you find any of these brands? This is not long ago maybe 15-20 years ago. None of these brands are to be found. Right. Say if you if you have a BlackBerry, like you know, first thing you go to a meeting, you keep the BlackBerry on top of the table, and then it, it shows your who you are, right? Or like you know, Kodak has a film roll. All of us have used those. Now we don't see, right? So if I ask from the audience, how many of you are using a camera? Unless you are into photography, we have. I can see one cameraman. He's into photography for sure. Unless you are into wildlife, etc. How many of you are using a camera? None, right? I don't see any hands. But we take photos, right? Thousands of photos. We use, I don't know what, Instagram to social, Facebook to everything, right? It's entire way of what we are doing has got changed, right? So if I ask what are the top five brands of uh, cameras, like people will say Nokia to Olympus to all that. If you really look at it, no, those are not the top five brands. All the top five brands of the cameras are phones today because that's the highest usage. So dynamics have changed. So all these brands, when you're looking at all these brands as uh, uh, their capital or the value of the organizations bigger than our country, GDP. All these companies are bigger than $100 billion. And less than, like in you know, 15 years ago, they were $100 billion and today they disappeared. So this is, this is the reality, right? So you end up, I mean, I put that picture with a PC on a cemetery, like, you know, it's like rest in peace, right? They're gone. So, I mean, it's, it's common for all of us, like the message here is like, you know, if you really doesn't get our act together as an organization and you doesn't make the decision at the right time, this is what will happen, right? I mean, probably we'll end up at the Burala Cemetery faster. So, we need to think through uh, wherever we work, institute we work or, or, or how you really get act together. Say, if I take a smaller example, right, and decision making is also right uh, at the time, which is Kodak. Why they lost the market to invent of the digital camera? They never embraced a digital camera. They went with the traditional, the real camera, whatever analog camera what they had. But in 1975, they invented the digital camera. But they never went to the market with the digital camera. The reason being, they were worried about the business model they are in. They will lose all the peripheral, like you know, they were really in the, selling the cameras, reels, the chemicals for uh, papers to everything. With that fear, they never went to the market. But what happened after? Uh, 20 years, they completely went out of the market without embracing the new transformation and you never adapted the technology. So with that, I will move in, which is when you're looking at these brands, very familiar, right? I mean, all of us use these. Uh, Uber, Daraz, Airbnb, like uh, uh, Daraz, everybody knows it's this, I mean, in Asia, that's Alibaba extension. Uh, now, if I ask a question like, you know, who, who is the biggest taxi company in the world and how many taxis they have? Uber is the biggest taxi company in the world. They don't have a single taxi by themselves. It's crowdsourcing, right? Airbnb is the biggest hotel chain in the world. And how many hotel rooms they have? None. They don't have a single hotel room. Daras, biggest, we say, retail outlet in the, like, 
in this part of the world, like Alibaba, when you look at probably the, uh, the, the biggest in the world, how many physical shops or supermarkets they have? None. But they are the biggest in the world now. So, simple app we have here and technology has taken over. Right? So, this is what the transformation is all about. So, if you are if you're traditionally into, we say, taxis, like it's say older days when you're watching a US movie, you saw those yellow cabs, right? Like, you know, uh, on, on movies. Nowadays, if you visit US, you don't find those. I mean, you top of the road, you put your hand and uh, you get into it, you can't. Unless you have an app, you can't even get a taxi. All right. If you go to, if you go to China, like and if it doesn't have the QR code enabled or app is enabled, you can't even buy a cup of tea. Right, so that's that's where the world is moved in, and from a local point of view, right. Also, these are local leaders, which is Pikmi, Oda, Coral. Uh, there are a few more in the list, which is I put few of those. They are they are transforming. They are transforming the way we do work and how we do things. Right, say uh, earlier, like you know, we used to go like what four o'clock in the morning to a queue to get a doctor's appointment of that number, and there are people who are selling around the corner to that. But we don't do that now. You go to the app. You book your doctor's number. So things have changed. Things have evolved. This is a very uh, interesting slide. I think you need to really internalize uh, this. Uh, and I will talk a little bit about the Sri Lanka status later. Later on that. So when you're looking at uh, from a digital economy point of view, uh, digital economy is growing faster than the traditional or GDP, the contribution. So which is mature markets? When you really look at it, it's we are getting close to about 50% of the contribution to the GDP from this digital economy. A global average is about 40%, like in even low income countries is crossing 17%. Remember these numbers, right? I will talk about the Sri Lankan context and mid income countries are 30% and it's growing. So this, this actually got triggered fast tracked uh, after the COVID uh, situation came in because the digital adaption became really uh, important and they felt this is the way forward because they, everybody was forced to experience it, all right? So, I mean, a simple example like when you're forced to experience it, you tend to test it, you don't have a choice, but you continue to do that, right? So, we are talking about the uh, digital adaption. One classic example is like, you know, the QR code we had. We never had a choice. We had to get it done. Otherwise, you can't get fuel, right? We never had a choice. So, 6 million people downloaded the QR code and still as of today, people are using it. So that's that's how it is the power of technology, right? It's it's not the case of nobody give or like you know government didn't give additional fuel. It's it's about the QR code made the difference and one like you know on a Sunday they announced the QR code and one week trial they went and next week the queues disappeared. All of us waited for three four hours or three four days actually get twenty liters at that time, right? So it's it's technology made that difference. Or like, you know, I, I use this example most of the time when I talk to uh, public or like, you know, especially the children uh, when I do my lectures, right? Say, uh, I call it a, this Yohani theory. Uh, say this uh, singer, Yohani, which is, is she the best singer we had in our country? I don't know. I don't think so, right? We had best. Possibly. But uh, what is the highest viewership for, like, you know, reach got? Like, you know, say she got 300 million within no time. And she became globally, like, you know, I saw recently she was getting award in Gulf also, right? So how this reach was achieved? Because of technology. Just imagine she had to go for 14,000, uh, whatever, Gramasayuka divisions, 10 shows a day to so many to reach, at least to reach 20 million people, it will take so much of time. But technology within no time, she reached... 300 million people. So that's that's how the technology. So this is these indications is all about how the technology or digital is contribution to the GDP. Now, one simple example, if you take a country like New Zealand, their exports of digital economic part is $8 billion. Are they exporting technology? No. They are using technology for the agriculture and dairy. Because that is one of the biggest exports for New Zealand. So that's how they how they increase in the yield, how they increase in the productivity, all that is basically purely using technology. Now it's very important to do this, like you know, to understand that we need to have a digital ecosystem. So everything has to come in, like you know, the digital economy will come in one piece, then the infrastructure need to come in, then the society need to come in. All this has to be, be blended, uh, and then only we can get a very cohesive output out of it. If you have missing links, 
on this like you know from a policy point of view or regulation point of view then we are we will be not able to really implement it or we will not able to take it to the next level it's super critical that we understand what needed and what are the gaps as a country we have and how do you bridge those gaps because some laws are made like you know maybe some 18 something but does it really make uh, sense for the modern day no with these things has to be changed all right so some 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 are getting updated some need to get it updated so as a as a pressure group as an industry association this is what we are doing and definitely the audience need to understand what need to be changed and definitely that wherever you attach or the contributions you make with the organization for the society you really need to think how do you really do drive this change so this is a little lit, the slide is a little older but when you're looking at all the sectors you took, talk about automation you talk about banking media communication etc the digital adaption is really on the high curve right a uh, couple of trillion dollars the compounded annual growth this is even more now this this is 2020 number 17.9 percent uh, which is clocked so all the industries you name it in material what industry or you think this is this is an industry which is going to go uh, rest of the 10 years on analog mode or the traditional mode no it's not the case things are getting changed the curves are getting changed you can see every possible uh, industry in this curve which is getting into this this is another interesting fact like you know say from a digital adoption point of view there are categories of starters adapters and frontiers like in you know, some of the countries unfortunately Sri Lanka is not clocked here as a nation probably the data availability etc uh, on some of the information but the key is when you really look at it like you know how uh, the adoption during the covid the adoption or the investments reduced obviously everybody has challenges uh, with the economic downturn etc but when you're looking at this the frontiers which is who's leading continue to invest on technology so looking at adapters had a drop of 14 percent minus whereas the drop of frontiers is seven percent that they mean they continue to invest and the other thing is it budgets the drop is only 1.4 percent whereas non-IT budgets actually dropped or oh, 4.5 percent that means even the cost cutting or the funding is getting cut or the budget is getting cut where the lesser percentage is cutting getting cut on a digital point of view or a technology point of view because that that importance has been felt what the amount of kitty you have you prioritize on technology adoption now we are looking all we are looking ahead of the fifth industrial revolution so this is where the entire change will move right so we are a generation who's living through the fourth industrial revolution say in school we learn or historically we have learned like you know the first second third and it took couple of hundred years first to second to third which is coming in and we are living through the fourth industrial revolution right now and we are talking about the fifth, fifth industrial revolution so this is where the technology which is coming in we will get merged with the what you call the the digital law the energy piece uh, uh, which is the carbon neutrality so carbon neutrality also become a key factor uh, on the entire equation now these two lines are getting closer and closer which is the fourth industrial revolution which is a topic we are talking about the digital economy that is going to be the key or that is the key driver of it. Uh, adoption of technology is happening and the things are getting changed and fifth industrial revolution we are talking about the carbon neutrality and which is we are talking about metaverse how the digital twin is all about like we have the real and the uh, digital version of that now already some of the countries have in discussion on policies and regulations are made for the metaverse not for the digital economy alone they are making regulations if you look if you follow the digital uh, the world economic forum which happened in Davos in January or February this year there are a lot of videos available in YouTube still you can watch how some of the countries their leaders talking about making regulations for the metaverse now I mean obviously we are little behind but we are now trying to figure out what the policies are the changes has to be done in the uh, digital economy point of view but obviously we need to go ahead with the curve otherwise we will have a challenge as a nation now what this digital economy mean or uh, like you know technology adoption what it means right so there are key three factors uh, one is more or less everything is getting sensed all things are connected 
and all things are getting intelligent as when artificial intelligence and the equation comes in which is goes to the cloud right so now very simple example some of i mean say we do a lot of letter writing right or we do if you are somebody studying you do theses whatever it's very simple today right if you want to write a letter we say i don't know 100 words 200 words to somebody interesting you type it you do proofreading again you do and probably if your secretary would say okay write it again and probably it'll take half a day to get the letter out right and then somebody will do a proofreading and then the grammar correction whether right or attention or like you know wording is right now it's very simple right you open up chat gpt you say this is what you want audience is this i want 100 words letter simple is given is given right and your english is correct no grammar mistakes all done so the, i mean this is these are tools which is like you know trillions of data which is available and it say uh, i can see some younger generation is laughing here probably they are doing it for their thesis i don't know you are studying now uh, possibly uh, but i mean in in my opinion i don't think there's anything wrong with that because for chat gpt gpt give you a right answer you need to ask the right question unless you ask the right question you would get the right answer right so now you know who's in high demand on the it industry point of view there are a category called prompt engineers that means they should their their job is to prompt these artificial intelligent tools to get the right answers out so this is where the world is heading so i mean i i took like one example like you know say here this becomes a critical factor because all things are sensing uh, and like more or less you scan or whatever the way you sense it qr codes to all this and is connected and this is where the security comes into play is become a so critical factor in one of these layers it get breached we'll get into trouble so how uh, i will allow probably mohan will talk more in detail about in depth on that how how this is been managed and what what examples we have but now we are we are we are becoming highly dependent on that and we have to make sure our data to information to everything has to be secured and what what need to be done for it now these are few trends which is we can say uh, there are di different definition but uh, with the interest of the time i will take one or two of those which is talking about how these uh, yeah, the domains are getting uh, impacted right so if i take uh, one of the things like food uh, even we are talking very uh, consciously about the food security uh, right now from a country point of view even global point of view that's that's a challenge right uh, the example i took with uh, new zealand how they are using technology for dairy and agriculture how the things like iot artificial intelligence etc has been used uh, in these domains to make increase the productivity increase yield reduce wastage traceability uh all that like you know say common common factor which is we see on news suddenly you say uh, some of the we say potato farmers are one day coming and throwing all the potatoes in the road and saying like you know i don't have a market price i don't sell the issue is so many farmers so many acres have grown potatoes but when you want carrots they don't have carrots right so how technology can help to manage this equation i mean there's a very basic example so how do you reduce wastage all that can be done using technology i'm not going into very detail i'm like you know talking on the surface how technology can be used or we are talking about energy this is another hot topic for us like you know how the smart grids etc can help to minimize uh, the wastage etc and productivity can be increased how the metering can be done all that so, like you know also we are talking about digital power here again green like you know solar to everything storage uh, all that come in how the energy uh crisis can be handled or or how we become more stable on the energy point of view so there are many examples of that like you know healthcare or digital trust i mean digital trust obviously a separate topic all together uh living spaces we are talking about the smart cities smart homes all these hot topics are very much part of it so it's 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 very important uh we need to understand like you know the as three priorities like you know we need to make sure that we should this should be affordable everybody should be able to affordable like you know downstream who in the most rural village uh they if they are not able to afford this then no point having best of the technologies because they can't make use of it only few people few thousands of people using it it's not going to make a big difference and innovation has to happen like you know which is connectivity need to be there seamless thank i mean for as a nation we have 
close about 90% on uh, 4G coverage obviously soon of expecting 5G to come in. Uh, so our connectivity is kind of de uh, decent. So we need to have the cloud uh, mobile devices which is need to be addressed. Uh, and there are certain policy changes or policy updates also need to happen. So basic examples like okay there are some grey areas possibly I mean this may come to the purview of the central bank as well. Okay financial data can it be put in the cloud. So I think there's a grey area whether uh, definition is being can you we have to keep it in within the borders of the country or can you take it out so these policies has to be get upgraded and from a security point of view how do you how do you really get that done and we need to have the applications which is ready right so uh, the application has to be there one basic example was a QR code right which is the the at the need of the time which is we got that tool and we managed to get out of the queues so we we need to have right tools coming in right applications coming in uh, you should be able to pay your taxes to get your construction permits to I don't know whatever the services what you go which is your suppose I mean there are many services where we are waiting in a queue of taking a full days of leave or two days of leave so how do you get rid of this on that and all that can be there you need to have the skill to use this unless you have the skill to use this uh, obviously people will not use it right so I mean starting from protecting your password and the login ID like you know it's super critical like you know people put one two three or your name or like you know easily it's somebody can hack it or get onto it so how do you get your fundamentals right you need to have the and also you need to have the skill to use it so I will talk about I talk about the global picture uh, which is the digital economy and how so Sri Lanka actually we are we are being far behind but we are looking at leapfrogging uh, as an industry association, as central bank, uh, minister of technology, communist regulator, government, we have an initiative all of us are embarked on which is we are called a digital economy 2030. So we have a brand called DigiCon uh, 2030. So I will talk about what this exactly means and what, what, what's actually around it. So in March last year, uh, we, are, uh, we embark on this journey uh, right now. Uh, so we are looking at a 30, uh, 15 billion dollar uh, goal to be reached by 2030 from a digital economy contribution point of view. So we are at about maybe with the contraction we are at about possibly uh, um, central bank will have the exact data but estimation is maybe say 60, 70 billion dollars but that can be about contribution about 20 to 25 percent of the digital economy. We are in a very bad stage right now we are at about 3.4 billion that's about 4.3 percent less than 5 percent. We are at the low income countries at about 17 percent so that means we need to fast track or we need to run really really fast so right now which is we are working as a team uh, which is uh, guided by the world bank where I'm, I'm part of that uh, tech, uh, the the team which is chaired by the president himself so by november before the budget we are expecting that uh, report to be out with actionable items with town by town time bound actionables now when you're looking at from a global point of view, uh, from a pillars, what the areas you need to work, right? So these are six pillars which is we can identify digital infrastructure, public digital platforms, digital financial services, digital businesses, digital skills and digital uh, trust environment. So trust is the topic what we are talking about today which is I am talking about why the trust is so important because the usage is getting increased and we need to make sure the protection of our information data has to be done so this is the plan what we are working on uh, from a very high level point of view uh, together with the world bank etc so there are six thematic areas one is a broadband connectivity access and use uh, then the second one is the digital data and services infrastructure this is primarily focused on the government then the digital industry skills and jobs this is focused on the education and uh, job oriented education digital safeguard is a trust part what you're talking about digital transaction is again the uh, the digital uh, finance piece then we have the digitization of the key economic industries SME we have prioritized because 52 percent of our GDP contribution coming from the SME point of view and we have 1.7 million SMEs and uh, hardly we have uh, anybody who's digitized uh, on that piece so we are looking at evolving tech with artificial intelligence like you know moving from fourth to fifth to industry 4G, 5D, etc, etc and blockchain and newer, new emerging technologies be brought into the equation. So this is how as an industry uh, association we are working on which is FITIS consists of eight chapters. We have the hardware chapter, software chapter, education and training chapter, communication chapter, digital services chapter, office automation, professional chapter, 
So these chapters actually are consist of interest groups of the subject. Like, and it's very clear hardware chapter is uh, infrastructure. That is the people who are the interest groups of the infrastructure. Uh, then education and training is the people who are non-state education community whose interest groups the education. Software chapter is the software development companies. So we are very much aligned with the six thematic areas and we are working with the World Bank, which is, as I said, I'm part of the, the team and with the board of directors and the membership is working on how do you contribute the goal I said 15 billion before that's that's the goal we have to uh, looking at and how we are fueling around it to get that achieved so this is this is how we are going to do it so in the center you can see the uh, digital economy so national agenda is uh, country GDP how do you grow the GDP uh, and in terms of contribution for the uh, digital economy so six thematic areas. So we are looking at a more of a new business model, uh, obviously like you know cross functional approach across uh, the interest groups and we are looking at the 15 billion dollar goal. Obviously when you do that which is our membership is corporates and there is a fair share which is they can harvest from a business point of view which is the uh, business growth will happen. And also we need it's important we go regional as well because we need to make sure that we go downstream to uh, like you know help the rural communities as well because otherwise the economic impact or like in you know, a real turnaround will be not felt. Now there are digital trusts from a creating that environment uh, it's important to have the fundamentals right. So uh, as I said data protection need to come into play. So a lot of data has been created like say uh, uh, you when you go to any place you take your ID card, passport, even QR. Uh, even you go to a hospital wherever so much of data is collected manually right some are getting digitized so uh, what is happening to this data or QR code like you know, 6 million people's data like you know we scan during the what do you call the COVID time like you know wherever we went uh, there's a lot of data so we need to make sure that data is protected there's the right framework has to be there and there regulations has to be done uh, policy has to be done etc then the cyber security point of view so now whether technology can be breached, we, we have seen in news globally as well as locally there had been hacks which is happening right across uh, which is uh, is being a challenge. But how do you make sure that cyber security is being ensured because that is where the trust is coming right. Somebody wants to use like you know all the days like you know when, when the tele machines came like you know we started slowly withdrawing money then the option came into deposit people are still worried like you know whether when you deposit in the tele machine with the money will give to my account still you go to the counter right. And afterwards when people saw like you know confidence then pop, I mean hardly any of us go to the bank right now right everything happens here. So like that we need to get then the governance structure has to come. These are super critical and I will talk about in the next slide there are few actions has been already taken some are work in progress. Obviously, this has to be done and one super critical factor is uh, sadly we I mean now government is working on it which is that is ID. So we have the manual ID like you know from we are probably one of the first countries in this part of the world or even globally when you are looking at it to get the national ID card but unfortunately we are far behind the uh, digital piece digital ID coming in because this is this is so important like you know when you have that identification you does not have to fill all those forms like you know your KYC you know your customer is kind of done you, wherever you go I identified you or even a traffic offense to hospital to whatever you are not right this is being identified this becomes a, like you know really the fundamentals of that. And the key is we are talking about the digital lock and we are talking about business banking healthcare all that is coming in but we need to understand all this is getting developed crime is following right. You have the malware to ransomware to all that is coming in and we see a lot of news uh, on these kind of uh, attacks coming in. But the laws and the regulations are getting strengthened. Uh, obviously we need to work as a nation on the way we are forwarding on it as I said before. And it's really required like you know many sectors require training for compliance. Compliance has become a super critical factor on basic things like you know say I mean basic fundamental thing you give your password to somebody else right like I mean you say please log in and do this. I mean this is bridge big time right. It's like nowadays if you are giving a, your pa phone password it's it's like you are giving your entire wealth right your bank account everything is everything is inside this right. What I mean I can't imagine anything does not I mean does not go in there. So everything is very much possible right. If you if you are giving your password of this that means it's like you are given your life. So that's 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 super critical and the compliance has to be 
uh, taken care of. So I, I spoke about all these getting industries like you know media broadcast into intelligent control to like you know smart grids to all this is like you know healthcare is getting getting uh, changed. Uh, now we are talking about intelligent driving driverless vehicles etc. Like if there is a security breach on that entire network you can imagine the situation which is we are running in or the grid or smart grid what we are running in. So all this has to be looked at perfectly we really need to study and we have to make sure that right uh, tech or the protection is being created. So this is where we are right now. So Cyber Security Act 23 is in the draft stage. I think there's about a week left uh, if you are interested of uh, providing feedback, uh, then it will get finalized. It's at the public uh, feedback stage right now, you, which is you can, if you're interested, definitely you can provide your inputs to that. Personal uh, Data Protection Act, which is 2022, was get enacted in the parliament. Then we had the Electronic Transaction Act 2006. Uh, then we had the Computer Crimes Act. These, these were done uh, very much ahead of the curve in 2007. Then we have the Intellectual Property on 2003. Uh, payment and system, I mean settlement systems which is 2005, then the Payment uh, Devices Fraud Act which is 2006, right. So it's 2003, uh, the one which is the intellectual property etc. That is the time which is uh, government launched the what you call the Sri Lanka program. That is where ICTA was initially formed and uh, they were looking at a journey, first time in history, we were looking at a more of a uh, technology journey and it resulted in uh, like you know close to about 2 billion dollars of IT exports etc the industry get more boosting coming in with uh, in 2003 time frame which is where the intellectual property act uh, came to act. So with that I will uh, get into the conclusion right now it's, it's we need to start right now it's not big things it's about big technology we need to educate on what and we need to create knowledge about it like you know we need to do training and how we need to create skill and awareness need to create on why and understanding about what importance of that. So if we, I mean we do not think like really big starting with small steps right now on the, like you know knowledge skills and the understanding of importance of this and what need to be done definitely we can start uh, ahead of the curve and we have a huge leapfrog to be done from 5% to uh, which is rest of the world is at 20% 25% average which is we need to catch up uh, within next 7 years or so. With that, I will conclude. Thank you. I think that's going to be a Q&A session afterwards, which is I will, there are any questions, more than happy to take. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Soisa, for that uh, truly insightful session. Uh, now, I would like to invite Mr. Mohan Chaturanga to delve into the subject with a specific emphasis on the cybersecurity. Mr. Chaturanga is a cybersecurity professional and, and a consultant. He is also former Deputy General Manager, IT Governance, at the Mass Holdings and member of ISACA Sri Lanka and also head GRC Taras Regional of Alibaba Group. Mr. Uh, Chaturanga, the screen is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for the organizing committee and, and thank you Lakma for inviting me in. And uh, uh, it's been a pleasure to uh, uh, introduce you to Digital Trust today. And uh, just to give you a bit of background, uh, what I've been doing. So I've been into cybersecurity for pretty much most of my career. And uh, I've been into consulting spaces and infrastructure services into Australia, New Zealand region, and been into manufacturing security. And, and uh, just before here, I was in uh, New Zealand doing a role into cybersecurity consulting. And now, as, as correctly introduced, uh, I look into the uh, security of Daras Group in terms of uh, how we do e-commerce uh, platform in in our operating markets. So that is what we are doing. Uh, so so to simplify that for you, so whenever you do transactions uh, around buying something in Daras, and uh, over the fifty million people who are doing across the globe, so that the role of me is to make sure that the data that you use and the payment infrastructure and the, anything that you share with us is safe. So, so that's the very simplest definition of my day job. And uh, so just to give you a bit of context, I'm, I think as correctly uh, in the call also mentioned, the digital adaption has gone over the roof and things have changed a lot during the past 10 years for Sri Lanka and for the entire Southeast Asia economies as well, where the point where we primarily operate in. And uh, when uh, 
I was invited uh, for this. Uh, uh, the first instruction was don't get technical. So uh, I'll try to not to be technical uh, in, in a technical field of study, uh, but I'll try to explain certain concepts around uh, digital trust and how we ensure that all those concepts that Indika was also explaining around digital adoption, a lot of things happening, the way we operate, the way we business, the way we do transactions, the way we interact with banks, the way we interact with shops, the way we interact with each other, in, in, including social life, it has changed to a digital format. I'll give you a quick of example. Uh, so you just heard a profile in introduction of me. And uh, I, I pretty much know that uh, about 10, 15 people who are right now here have, has viewed my LinkedIn profile. So welcome to my digital profile. So because those who people who viewed my profile would already know a lot more than people who are here, right? So the world is changing into digital identities and digital economies. And uh, as I previously explained, the metaverse and everything is replicating your digital identity. And it's no longer sometimes your physical self that is of interest to the economy or to the country. It is your digital self. So with that quick intro, what we want to discuss here today is why digital trust? That's the first thing. So you all recognize all these brands, right? So pretty much I believe more than 99% of this audience recognize them. And there's a happen to be either a website or either a mobile application but you happen to know them, right, somehow. And maybe majority of you are using one or more. And a majority of you must be using, uh, must know someone who has, you know, done a transaction or a purchase on that, even if you don't have. So the chance is that someone who, is, who has never, ever used any of these platforms is quite remote within this audience. So one of the factors about digital trust is that when we do transactions previously, it was about an eye contact, a person here, a handshake, right? But you visited all these websites, you used pick me, you have no idea who sold you that ride. You never understood who was the rider. You never understood how it was got paid, right? But you still used it. So even if you look at Daras, what we do at Daras, so you have no idea. I, I think a lot of you would not even know where this country office is, right? So you have no idea, but you still work with us. So the idea is that you trust us. So how do we be, build digital trust? And same goes to all the mobile applications. So people who are here would have more interest in that field. Uh, that do you trust your application? Do you trust your online payment applications? Simple example of that is, uh, if I ask you a simple question for, to answer that, uh, have you used mobile application? Anyone in the audience? Internet transaction ever being used? You have used? Yes. So you have transferred money, I believe. You have done payments, I believe. Right. So a lot of people nod yes. And uh, I believe you have uh, paid utility bills, probably. Right. Right. Have you transferred more than 3 million rupees over the digital app? Very few. Have you opened a, opened FD? Yes, some have. Have you withdrawn money, uh, withdrawn an FD to a service account? So now we understand even with the people who are adopting digital, there's a level of trust that we built, isn't it? Right. I trust you to transfer 1,000 rupees for me, but I would not trust you to, you know, transfer 3 million for me. So there's a, there are layers of digital trust as well. So, so how do you bridge this gap of digital trust? So I'm pretty comfortable to go to the bank and talk to someone, to a teller, and, and say that hey, I need to transfer 3 million, 5 million rupees over the counter. But I would be reluctant to do that transaction because you are anyway allowed to do that over 5 million per day. But why would, why would you not do that? So, so the, uh, some of the emphasis that uh, even who, people who are in e-commerce business like us trying to do is build this digital trust and uh, our business is e-commerce and we look at it from a point of view that how, how trustworthy are we in the eyes of our consumers for in our language what that means is you search in the internet okay latest fashion product you search in the internet something you want to buy a quick thing so you came to the us and you bought it and 
are you going to be a part of our app for the rest of your lifetime and anything that you want would you buy from us so so that's the digital trust for us and uh, so right now that physical interaction physical signatures handshakes are quite going out of shape and we are introduced with our digital profiles and the e-commerce the online services hybrid workforces and digital identities have totally changed this so if you ask me do we know the 50 million people that we serve yes we do have you ever met them no we haven't so that's the economy that we are in and uh, how we have built trust is by asking certain critical questions and asking uh, and building certain capabilities in security and certain capabilities in way we do business so uh, same way i think some of the conversations that we have around uh, the banking sector is that how are we going to drive that digital trust so start off with a simple area so today i represent the isaka community as well so probably you'd have an introduct quick introduction at the beginning so we have done a research around how we build digital trust so we are a community of people who are operating across the globe and uh, we have looked at certain industries so our professionals work in primarily in cyber security audit compliance kind of industries and risk and we have looked at people uh, organizations who have more than 1000 employees and we have looked into these areas and done a bit of a research to understand what this digital trust means so this is a, so so for us to understand what this means so first of all organizations think okay the first question that you need to answer is whether do you think it is beneficial to have a digital trust so is it beneficial to have a recurring customer or is it beneficial to have less benefit or more beneficial to have you know try to convince you every day to someone that you are trustworthy so first thing that you have is a positive reputation so that is a must that even in our business that we try you for which is uh, you you need to look at it from a point of view that there are businesses in the world so for an example uh, there are data breaches that has happened so some parts of the world data breach is quite a significant consequence whereas probably in next few years in sri lanka also it will be because it's quite regulated and and if you have a bad reputation of protecting my data even though you offer the same service i would have a problem in terms of procuring that service problem is primarily the consumer space with our research what we understand is if my password and the payment information that i share with you and the login names user details when i share that with you the problem that i arise is that you would have data that can be a representation of me that can be used to impersonate me then can be used to represent me somewhere else so so because of that so any organization who, who would not have the right protective mechanisms or a reputation for positive a positive reputation for maintaining digital trust would have an impact on customers so this uh, uh so so the time that i was in 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 new zealand some of the clients that i worked with uh we call that uh in a way uh, the trust based sales trust based sales so that means that the more security that you have the more secure you feel in terms of doing your transaction primarily on online that people are people will come back to you to do the transactions i'll give you one example so you have seen certain websites where you go to do the transaction and by the end of it at your shopping cart you will probably be redirected to a dodgy kind of a payment gateway right so there are a lot of people who just discontinue at that point so we have seen that we have looked at it and uh, certain geographical uh, challenges are also there so some people drop out at the chinese uh, payment gateway because they think that it's dodgy in a way as well so it's just an experience of digital trust so but your reputation depends on it it's not whether your data is leaked or not how much of digital trust are you building by using reputed technology that's number one and the other thing is that uh, when you when when you have digital trust you would have reliable data so one one other area is the data that you use are mostly manipulated in 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 e-commerce uh, there are bots insights for an example if we look at 10000 people at a given 5 minutes in an e-commerce site 
there will probably be about you know 100 to 200 bots who are scrolling the site as well. So, so basically uh, the right data, if you want to take right data, so if you are to see how many actual people who visited the RAS at any given point, so we can't just rely on uh, the data that is out there. So we have to dig deep and see who, how many actual people were there. So if you build digital trust around your brand, so you will get to understand who are the actual people, actual data around it. So that is one other thing as well. And uh, one last thing, uh, uh, one last point we have, I want to highlight is uh, with the Pre Personal Data Protection Act also getting getting enforced in Sri Lanka. Uh, a lot of people, the, the context, so, so I was involved in this very, very long time back in 2018 when GDPR was launched and uh, there were a lot of conversation around it. Um, so when we were talking about it, uh, does people need privacy? That was the first conversation uh, some of the professionals had at that time, because this comes from a concept of privacy. So privacy has a lot of other areas, bodily privacy, physical privacy. So, so by, by nature, as a culture, we, we do not practice bodily privacy. So, so when, what you mean by bodily privacy, we, we stand next to each other in a queue, isn't it? Right. So where privacy is practiced in other parts of the world, they don't do that. That is disturbing your bodily privacy. So, so getting people to understand the concept of privacy and, and then, then, then working towards data protection is a challenge itself because it's not in our genes, it's not in our DNA. So, but when you adopt more digital technologies, you will get to understand that it's important that your digital data has same protection as yourself, right? So, quick example, would you like all your illnesses to be published on Facebook? All your medical reports, what do you feel? Would you like all your personal data where you have been in the last seven days to be published on the internet? Would you like that? Would you do that? So that is privacy. So if we track a person on our payment application and we track the location of that person and we get breached, and your locations for the last seven days is out there, do you trust us? Would you trust us with your data anymore? So these are the questions that we ask ourselves. So it's not just the data that you do in a transaction, but would our digital trust be embedded going forward? And some of the consequences, so the decline in that and the cybersecurity incidents, uh, some of you would not be aware of, so, and some uh, might be, so, all the incidents that you're getting, all those spam messages, click on this link, uh, you get 50,000, someone, you know, wealthy Persian prince is going to give you $5 million for something. So all that is leading you to a cybersecurity incident. So getting your information, reaching into a system, getting your credentials compromised and all that. And so if you are to build digital trust, your brand, if you are representing a bank, if, if, the, if that bank, if people are getting SMSs, in the audience saying that bank's name as an alias requesting information and ultimately that information is leaked so you will have a problem so i won't go into the later areas and how do you know whether people trust you so that's the priest that we want to build around so how do you know whether people trust you of course the traditional methods of customer service issues raised in customer service and monitoring customer retention, all this can be used. But I can give you quick tips around some of the new ones as well. So in the customer trust domain, uh, customers trust you if, you if they would like to give you more data. So that is how customers trust you. So if you go to a supermarket, so you, you purchased one thing, but then your rest of the life, if you are visiting the same supermarket, that means you trust them. Same way, if someone comes and fi fills up three fields and buys something from us, and next time they come and do you know eight fields for us, they trust us. So so some of the data patterns that are out there over the time, how you share them is an indication of digital trust. And and the other thing is organizationally, uh, I'll give one example. Uh, the what you see on the right side is on the organization trust. You if you have called some of the banks, you realize the questions that you get asked are different right to verify you so there are a few data points that would get verified about you some banks have a very uh, robust methodology around it 
how your digital identity is verified because well, what you need to verify is because are you the actual person who are coming in to do the transaction online or, or do the whatever the request that is online and in order to verify that uh, what are the data points that would be verified on you so some of the transactions you you some of the uh, authentications we call them the authentication authenticating me for who i am and uh, that you feel that you have been asked unnecessary information for for you to be verified as me so uh, if the questions that's been asked to you are logical right and you feel that your this is enough for your identity to be established at some point that's exactly the point of data that need to be recreated the uids as well i'll give you an example what's your phone number where what is your nic number and what was the last transaction that you have made how many savings account do you have probably we'll go for 5 to 6 right so that is a uh, establishment of your digital profile and establishing that you are who you are but at the same time pretty much if those data points are lost so you can someone else can create that identity so that is why it is important that organizational trust internally so you have a mechanism internally to make sure those profiles are safe whatever you have about your customers are safe so that is why the organization trust is also important with relation to the customer trust so that is how we build digital trust in an e-commerce to a online transaction business so we are trying to say if we are to verify them with five data points that is exactly the five data points we want to protect as well and in terms of the obstacles that we have faced so far so even with the i think it's rate rating in the uh, isaaka research as well and the lack of skills and training so a lot of people do not understand some of this science so this is bit we had voodoo science in a way as well you have to think against the system to see how it can be hacked so that is what we do and uh, if this is how it works how we can trick it so that is how we usually the cyber security professionals work bit freaky but yeah that's how it is uh, and and the other thing is that we have a tone from the top that for many organizations how that leadership team uh, believes in digital adoption together with digital trust and and it's quite commending that there's a lot of work that is happening across sri lanka as well in terms of the acts and and uh, and uh, the cyber security act personal data protection act all this gives a lot of credibility as a destination for sri lanka as well so so some of the challenges around that as well i think that cyber security bill is open for comments till august 18 so so where we also been commenting so for an example last a week back in pakistan this uh, the data protection bill was released so so there was a data localization so basically you had to localize data so coming from a background in alibaba so we had a lot of challenges so just like that lot of e-commerce players would raise those challenges so now where the data is actually held so these are questions that people are asking where are you going to hold your data and how is that managed having those conversation internally is an important piece and organizations get challenged when the regulators you know uh, limit that so the basic question some of us were raising is that do you really think localizing can be more secure so some of the technologies some of the uh, uh, banking technologies that you would understand is we have to localize the data but the local infrastructure in terms of that is there could that be safer than the more advanced amazon or alibaba or uh, microsoft services so which would be more secure so these are some of the conversations that you have to have an organize as an organization to see whether how you are managing your digital trust so few points i want to leave out with you might be technical might not be to some of the people so challenges which has came in is that the why we still consider remote work as a challenge is purely because one thing we used to trust locations so simple as that in security why remote work was is a challenge is we used to trust locations so if you are connecting from a bank or an office so that end to end tunnel we trust we know that you are coming from there you have a door you have a card you go in there you connect from a machine now we know that you are there now after covid the only thing that happened is you we don't know who you are where you are actually so i simplified a very extreme question scenario for you but remote work becomes a cyber security challenge simply because of that 
so there is no other reason so it's just you don't come from a trusted location now we have to verify you instead of the location so this is the simplest theory in terms of how remote work becomes a cyber security challenge and uh, now people are no longer connecting to do transactions from fixed locations they are from random locations so phishing is all the emails and all the sms's that you keep getting saying that fabulous offers so these days so we we, we, we ran into scams on visa to everything right the foreign employment everything right you click on it you go somewhere there's a portal you submit all your data username password pretty much if you submit your password we know that you use that for about six seven eight websites and applications so that's your email address same email address probably be you we just need to do, steal it once so phishing is one of the greatest concerns there are malware and ransomware so which we call as simple terms viruses so they get planted organizations have a lot of controls but as individuals you people would not have your consumers would not have and they have the ability to detect what you are typing in your passwords and everything and and that gets leaked and customer behaviors so uh so customers tend to disclose their password willingly so uh, people willingly disclose their password and they have not been aware what that means and to to because their background also so but that's a significant challenge in digital trust you can't say we have invested you know 100 million dollars on security and my customers breached the security and and that breaches their con that breaches our digital trust you have to invest on your customers as well how much are you making them aware so so at the same time while you take the best action in the in the best interest of your customer you have to make them aware as well uh, spoofing so that means if someone type google in daras and and there are d r a s z dot com and if they go there you see pretty much similar similar site as daras so someone is trying to spoof us so, so spoofing is a quite common thing they get uh, taken down but in a day even your mobile applications and everything can become like this so there are services and technologies behind this which can detect this as well and the fraud and identity theft uh so the last point in that is fraud and identity theft so your all credentials it's just that you don't know it is leaked it is leaked so uh what you see as internet is the 30% of the actual internet it's 60 the rest of the rest of the 70% is what we call as dark web so there actually the credentials are there for to be solved so that's why you need to change your credentials and all that but these are challenges so we have to look at this and and build uh, certain systems and uh, areas to make sure that these are covered so strengthening the digital trust so we would encourage uh, people to ask the right questions so just as i was explaining to you the technical yes it's quite a technical subject in terms of data protection and information security but but building that security culture and some of the way that i explained it to you thinking from a point of view of building digital trust is a business conversation it's not necessarily a technical conversation technically it can be implemented but how are you going to create that trusted experience with your consumers and how how that is maintained throughout is a question that we all have to ask and it's an enterprise wide game it's not just technology team or a few teams can do it your product and the experience need to be designed in a way that it supports that and extremely important that all roles are involved right so so quick example i know a bank we I've, i've worked with them as well so 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 there's quite the quite serious about the security very serious and uh, and all that gets rolled down and on the digital adoption when you go to a branch they come to you and say would you like to use our new app and uh, at the login page they would like to say uh because if if they feel like you're struggling with the password they would come and say can you use this this meets all the criteria you can use this password at that point you would know pretty much everyone who came to that bank would have used that password so uh, so so you have to make sure that everyone understand that in the culture and and that loses pretty much the trust of a person saying that okay can i trust you with my data so so these are some of the conversations that you have to build enterprise wide and and you know make sure that the business teams are on board as well 
So few takeaways for today is that it's digital trust is not a technical uh, implementation or, or, or a solution adaption or a pure technical game. It's about how you build integrity and relationships and, and, and create secure transactions for the customers. And then there's guidance and frameworks around this. So we, not the day for today to discuss all that, but worldwide there are guidance and frameworks around it and, and worldwide the banking systems and, and payment and e-commerce businesses follow that. It's pretty straightforward. And uh, allocating a person is not an answer. Uh, there's significant commitment that you have to make in order to uh, build a digital build digital trust as an organization because as you would have seen from uh, in the presentation the digital economy the number of transactions and the volume of transactions that we would expect to have in 2030 is pretty much driven by driven by digital it, it's not driven by atm withdrawals so uh, so you need to really allocate your time and effort here and it's a 24/7 connected society so you are not doing transaction on eight to five. You are not doing buying eight to five. So even at an e-commerce business, a lot of people buy stuff when they're going to sleep. So uh, it's just fact. So if you're on the bed, you'll just buy something. It get delivered tomorrow. So, uh, and the digital trust can make and break because by 2030, as even the numbers suggest, probably people are doing 100% online transactions, electronic transactions. And if you, if you don't build digital trust, people are unlikely to work with you in the space of digital. So, so few takeaways on that. And uh, we are planned on that. And there is Isaka uh, research also for you. You can uh, you know, visit our website and, and look at that as well. Thank you.